Welcome to the Canyon Man Chronicles. You know, evil exists. It reared its ugly head again in Florida when a social reject walked unaccosted into a local high school and began shooting everyone in sight. You know, he killed 17 young Americans, injured others. It was fantasized, planned, and executed. Now the nation, even the world, is taking note. We have a reputation around the world for our gun culture here in America. But the ability to have those guns is also what makes us who we are. But let's be honest, people do evil things. They use a variety of tools to achieve their goals. Think about the slow cookers they used at the Boston Marathon bombing and the commercial jets and box cutters in 9-11. But it's the hardened darkness in their hearts really that drives their actions. Now we're left with the results of their despicable acts. We have to bury the once hopeful, innocent young lives who won't ever again be seen by their loved ones here on earth. We must fight back against this evil with everything we have, letting the memory of those lost drive us. We must be determined to thwart or at least minimize future attempts. But you know, mass violence is nothing new. Matter of fact, the worst school killing in the history of America goes way back to 1927 in Bath, Michigan. 38 elementary school children, and six adults, were murdered while the 58 others were injured. Andrew Kehoe killed his wife, firebombed his farm, then detonated an explosion at the school before he ended up committing suicide by blowing himself up in his truck. 44 innocent lives were lost, 58 people were hurt, and there was not a single gunshot fired. It's not the tool, it's the heart. Let's face it, those with evil hearts don't give a damn about any laws, any gun zones, or even the sanctity of human life. They're about to commit the ultimate crime, murder with a capital M. Laws only keep abiding citizens from committing crimes. Even then, we all have our own mores as to what's breakable and what's not. For example, maybe speeding or littering. But as the consequences of the conviction tend to increase, our likelihood of committing the crime decreases. Now, I might speed on the highway in North Dakota, okay, maybe pretty much everywhere, but I always slow down in construction areas because the penalties are worse and the danger to the workers is more severe. Would-be murderers, well, they're convinced of their ability either to escape or they don't care if they pay the ultimate price for being caught. Look, we can't keep someone from attempting evil. Sure, the better intelligence and people speaking up, we can probably prevent some of them from initiating their despicable acts. But this conversation is directed really at essentially two things. One, we want to minimize guns getting into the hands of those with evil intentions. And then two, defending against and neutralizing the threat once initiated. You know, the Second Amendment and what our forefathers meant is to me very clear. The government acknowledges it's our right, our right given to us by a creator, not one given to us by our government. And they may make no laws to infringe on that right. It is this ability of force that actually protects our other rights. It's our ability to be armed. Now, on a micro level, it's our God-given right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think you'll agree that we have a right to defend those. Well, how can we do that? How can we defend our rights against a threat if we are either outweighed, outnumbered, or just plain weaker? Obviously, it's a, with a weapon. It's an equalizer. It's a defensive tool that allows the would-be victim to at least have a chance to defend their rights. Now, imagine a 300-pound man who wants to beat, rape, or even kill a 110-pound, 70-year-old woman. Can she defend herself? Probably not. At least not without a weapon. Now imagine that there's three men, the same size, wanting to do the same thing. Does she have a chance? Of course not. 
take that same scenario now and put a gun in her hand. She just increased her ability to defend her right tenfold. Common sense speaks that a gun is the ultimate equalizer. Now in this new world of equality, hashtag time's up, hashtag me too, don't we want women also to have the ability to equally defend themselves? On a macro level, the forefathers spoke explicitly to the necessity of everyone having arms, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's from the Constitution of the United States, written in 1789 and ratified in 1791. Now, back then, well-regulated didn't mean highly controlled by government. It meant to, to be in order, uh, to work well, to be well-structured. And remember, the Constitution limits what the federal government can do. It's enumerated. So if it's not in there, they're not supposed to be able to do it. A lot of discussion revolves on what the Second Amendment means. So to gain some insight, let's take a look at what the Founding Fathers, who all agreed to the wording, what they thought. Thomas Jefferson, the author of our Declaration of Independence, well, what he said was, no free man shall ever be debarred the use of arms. Now, according to Patrick Henry, the great object is that every man be armed. Everyone who is able may have a gun. And that the said Constitution be never construed to authorize Congress to prevent the people of the United States, who are peaceable citizens, from keeping their own arms. That was announced by Samuel Adams. While Alexander Hamilton declared, the best we can hope for concerning the people at large is that they be properly armed. Now James Madison, who wrote the Second Amendment, he said, essentially, the right of the people to, bear, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the best and most natural defense of a free country. And nowadays, many ill-informed Americans question what exactly is a militia. Another founding father, George Mason, asked that and answered actually that very same question. I ask, sir, what is the militia? It is the whole people except for a few public officials. And then lastly, Thomas Jefferson also stated, what country can preserve its liberties if its rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. Now keep in mind, we became a country partly because our previous government, England, wanted to take away our guns. Heck, after just a few years of our, after our revolution, even the English writer James Berg acknowledged our Second Amendment as a strength for us. He said, most attractive to Americans, the possession of arms is the distinction between a free man and a slave, it being the ultimate means by which freedom was to be preserved. So they were clear. The government of the people, by the people, must have the ability to protect themselves from their own government should one day it go rogue. One of freedom's greatest dangers is for us to naively believe that this could never happen here in the United States. In fact, it has happened many times in history, and it will again. With that, I submit one other quote. The most foolish mistake we could possibly make would be to allow the subject races to possess arms. History shows that all conquerors who have allowed their subject races to carry arms have prepared their own downfall by so doing. That was Adolf Hitler. Pretty chilling, isn't it? Now, don't think for a moment that there aren't forces out there hoping for and fueling complete disarmament. They'll embrace any method possible to make America susceptible to failure and to fall from our greatness. Now, while the Second Amendment was ratified in 1791, it's still incredibly important and applicable today. Now, one of the objections against the amendment is that it was written when there were only muskets. Now, keep in mind, 
Those were the same weapons that the military had. But did you know that also back then, the Kaltoff repeater gun, which was capable of shooting as many as 30 rounds in 90 seconds, it was, or had already been invented. And did you realize also that the world's most advanced weaponized ships were owned not by governments, but by private citizens? So to say that the Second Amendment should only be applicable to muskets is to then by comparison declare that our First Amendment, the freedom of speech, only applies to the written word that's delivered by horseback and not through the internet or television or any other media. See, our founding fathers, they knew what they were doing. Back then, they were incredibly diligent and precise in their wording. If they meant we were only allowed muskets, they would have said it. This is where keeping gun regulations in check becomes very important. Look, it's not that pro-gunners or the NRA want lunatics to have lethal killing machines. And you know, to suggest anything of that nature is simply disingenuous. They just don't want the most important freedoms that we have to be eroded, piecemeal or fragment by fragment, until if we finally end up having no ability to resist. It is easy to stand for something, you know, when everything's going well. But even in these deadly times, the Second Amendment must not be infringed. As cold and heartless as that sounds, it's far worse to lose our nation's core values and our freedoms that come with them. Now, while some regulation is probably acceptable, regulations like national gun registration, it leaves gun owners vulnerable to having the government know where the guns are. This is not in the best interest of the militia and is of no advantage when attempting to reduce gun crime. Matter of fact, it's well documented that other countries have had gun registration prior to the banning and confiscation of guns, only to lead to mass genocide. Now, according to Snopes, which is a left-wing fact-checker website, mass killings of civilians by military dictatorships in the 1900s were, more often than not, preceded by the confiscation of firearms from targeted populations. This was preceded, made easier, by laws requiring the registration and or licensing of privately owned weapons. Now, you might trust our government, and you might not. But what about future governments? We can't be too short-sighted and just think about today. We must look long-term, just like our forefathers did. So what now? What do we change to protect our kids? Before we can talk solutions, we first need to know what the hell we're talking about. You see, being uneducated about a subject immediately nullifies your position. It doesn't nullify your intentions or your feelings, but it's just your position. So let's start there. Okay? Now, there are actually six types of, of actions in firearms. Now, for the purpose, for the purpose of this discussion, uh, we're going to stick really with just two main gun actions that often get confused and misused, sometimes to intentionally mislead. The first is fully automatic. Think machine gun or the Tommy gun or an M16. These are weapons where you can just press and hold the trigger and rounds will be continuously fired until you release it. Full-blown military weapons of war. Now, private citizens are banned from owning any of these that were made after 1986, and there's no exceptions. Now, those made before that, well, they can be bought and sold, but only after an incredibly extensive background check. They're also incredibly expensive, well north of $10,000. Now, to make a trigger that turns a semi-automatic automatic into an automatic is even more expensive, as you need highly specialized uh, types of milling machines uh, that is something that's basically impossible to do in your own garage. Now bump stocks, somewhat to re replicate an automatic trigger, vastly increasing the speed of firing, and probably should be banned due to the spirit of its purpose. It also should be notice, noted that none of the mass shootings in the last 30 years have involved a fully automatic rifle. None. So what's a semi-automatic? 
Now these are your AR-15 rifles and common handguns. One pull on the trigger, one round fired. Pull again, another round fired. These are the most common guns in mass shootings. Problem is, they're also the most common gun for sport and home defense, especially rifles. And as I said, the class also includes most of your common pistols and handguns. Look, most of any policeman, in the, and they're gonna have this weapon, and it's a semi-automatic handgun. The common handgun is actually used in more mass shootings than rifles. So, now that we know the difference between a semi-automatic and a fully automatic weapon, what about the evil assault rifle and the assault weapon? Well, one's real. It's a weapon of war and extremely dangerous in the wrong hands. And the other is a made-up name to make semi-automatic rifles sound scary and dangerous. An assault rifle is anything, is, excuse me, assault rifle is nothing really more than an automatic rifle. That's it. That's your full bore military killing machines. As mentioned before, essentially unattainable for the general public. Now, what's an assault weapon? Could it just be a semi-automatic weapon that's renamed to make it scary and give it a negative connotation? You bet. The term assault weapon is your ordinary rifle that has taken some of the cosmetic features from military weapons and adapt, adapted them to the citizen's rifles. Now, this is important. Throughout history, every citizen's gun is fashioned after military weapons. Why? Because the military usually has the most innovation. The citizen's weapon is just a copycat in style and some other useful features. So to give you an example, here are a few features borrowed from military style weapons. You have detachable magazines. It's a magazine that holds multiple rounds in it and readies them to fire. A detachable magazine gives the gun owner the ability to reload fairly quickly. Think, of it, think about now an example of the original Western six shooter or what we call a revolver. You put six bullets in and off you go. Now, this is essentially what a semi-automatic or assault weapon ban would leave law-abiding gun owners with, along with, of course, single shot rifles and shotguns. Now imagine a defensive situation, which is where most guns are used, where three guys break into your home and you only have six shots. You better shoot accurately. Many times, uh, only one or two shots per person is not enough to neutralize an attacker. Pistol grips, simply an extra handle on the gun to better control so you can accurately hit your target and not hit unintended targets. Now a barrel shroud, that's a, a bar, gun barrels get hot, and I mean really, really hot. Shrouds simply allow you to hold the gun with your non-shooting hand and not burning it. What's a flash suppressor? Well, when a rifle shot, it produces a flash of light. Now, we're in war and in home defense, it keeps the flash limited, which prevents detection of the shooter by the enemy. However, the more important use of a flash suppressor is for the shooter themselves. As they fire, they're looking down the barrel at where the flash occurs. And this can be blinding, especially in your dark home, defending against intruders. Momentary blindness can be the difference between living and dying. Now another one of the proposals out there that has actually already happened in states like California suggests limiting magazine capacity. You know, limiting amounts of ammunition in a magazine is, is basically pointless. It sounds good in theory, but in practical use, someone experienced with their weapon can swap out a magazine within one to three seconds. So whether a magazine has 10, 20, or even 30 rounds doesn't really make a whole lot of difference in its application. But it does if you barely have time to grab your weapon against home invaders. Now most certainly, America has a violence problem. But are AR-15 rifles the real problem of this? Let's discuss first what an AR-15 is. It doesn't stand for an assault rifle. Let me repeat that. It doesn't stand for an assault rifle. It was first designed in the mid-50s by the Armalite Rifle Company. Get it? AR Armalite Rifle? The first gun they made was a Model 1, the AR-1. They then came out with the AR-10 and so on. Now they're up to, I think, the AR-50. So how deadly are the rifles 
in terms of the violence of America. Well, between 1982 and 2017, there have been 143 mass shootings. Now, a mass shooting is four more people. Only a quarter of those were with rifles, and over half were with simple handguns. The rest, shotguns and revolvers. But let's share some good news, too. Homicides in 2011, which is the most recent statistic, were down 49% from 1963. So even though our population has dramatically increased and our gun ownership has increased, the murders have decreased. But how much of a problem are rifles? Well, in 2011, there were just over 15,000 homicides. And of all those homicides, only 3.4% were killed by rifles. Now compare that to over 65% of the total murders were with handguns. These statistics beg a question. Why are we so concerned about just the rifles and the 3.4% of murders and not the other 96.6%? Ask yourselves that. Now better yet, ask your politicians. You know, we need to realize that we can't infringe on the Second Amendment and ban guns without what I believe would be an all-out civil war. So let's take a look where we stand and embrace some basic truths. Where do mass shootings occur? Well, 98% of all mass shootings take place within a gun-free zone. 98%. Think about that. They happen mostly in schools, malls, churches. Why? Well, they're the easiest targets because they provide the least likelihood of, of resistance. Let's remember, the culprit has already decided to commit the most heinous crime of murder. No other laws matter. Gun-free zones are simply an invitation. In the animal world, a defenseless victim is considered prey. Now, once the carnage begins and the first call to 911 is made, which, by the way, we're requesting people with guns, good people with guns, the average response time is between four and eight minutes. Sadly though, most of the murdering and the, the maiming happens within the first two minutes. By the time the police have arrived, the shooter has either A, ran out of ammo, B, realized the horror of their actions and committed suicide, or C, they've been killed by someone on sight already. So what's the remedy? I believe really a three-pronged approach, preventative, defensive, and offensive. Now, what can we do preventatively? Currently, private citizens can buy and sell guns with each other without a background check. We need to require background checks on private purchases. Also, they're known as the gun show loophole. Now, we don't need to know who's selling the gun, just the background of the buyer. Make any transaction that takes place, take place at a dealer. You can't buy a gun from a dealer either at their store or at a gun show without a background check. Now, while this is going to affect mostly law-abiding citizens, what it's going to do is eliminate those ineligible to buy, to buy from good citizens. Now, we know there will always be a black market. Anything unlawful creates a black market automatically. Sex, drugs, firearms. Criminals will always be able to access guns on the black market. Mexico is a perfect example. We should also create tough gun laws that, upon conviction, eliminates a judge's discretion. Those who commit a crime with a gun, when convicted, should get the maximum penalty with a five-year minimum, more if they illegally are possessing the gun in their crime. But they do have the ability to plead a quarter of it off if they provide credible information leading to the conviction of the black market dealer. Also, let's not allow the media to use the names of the perpetrators. Yeah, I know, it sounds like an infringement of the speech, doesn't it? First Amendment, similar to infringement of the Second Amendment. Okay, well, while I'm kidding about creating a law, let's get the media, though, to support it and publicly declare that they won't glorify the shooter. After all, aren't they all about reducing shootings, too? Now, this would limit copycat opportunities. Let's instead concentrate on the lives of the victims. Let's also strengthen mental health diagnosis, prevent mentally ill from getting access. And this is a tough one though, because it attempts to strip a citizen of the right without due process. We need to figure out a constitutional solution here. Personally, 
I'm not comfortable with a doctor coming into the office in a bad mood and taking away my constitutional rights. And we also need to be what I call defensively offensive. Even with all the preventative measures that we could possibly take, evil will still find a way. So understanding that, we need to accept the inevitable. Attacks are going to still occur. We should protect our schools like we do our banks, our airports, and our courtrooms. After all, aren't our kids our most important assets? Now, an aggressor is not expecting, and nor do they want, resistance. Most would-be shooters incur what's called flight or fight mode when surprised by return fire, and it's overwhelmingly flight mode that takes over. Every YouTube example I've watched, and there's literally hundreds on there, where the shooter is confronted by return fire, they immediately engage in flight mode and try to run away. Now, we also need to admit that when policy fails and get rid of gun-free zones. Now, while there will be accidents, we need to let someone who is willing to defend themselves, and by default, others in the vicinity, we need to let them conceal carry. Gun-free zones steal a citizen's constitutional right to defend themselves. The only place a gun-free zone might make possible sense is in a courtroom where a conviction can take away any deterrent to gun use. Think of about a criminal who's been sentenced to life. Uh, they don't really have much to lose. We need to provide also armed ex-military and police guards at every school. Now, the amount depends on per, you know, how many floors there are, layouts, things like that. But after 9-11, did you know that we allowed pilots to conceal carry and we have air marshals on all the high-risk flights? We don't even notice that anymore. And we also haven't had a hijacking since then either. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. We should also allow teachers that want to, to arm themselves if they have a CCW, concealed carry weapon. It certainly shouldn't be mandatory, but if a teacher is, if teachers are ethically and morally bound to protect their students, shouldn't they have available to them the best means possible? Those that don't want to carry don't have to, right? For them, what we can do is let's provide inconspicuous biometric gun safes in every room with access by the staff. A biometric safe is one where it opens instantly when placing your thumb or fingerprint on the reader. This gives a teacher who's not willing to carry or is unable to carry for whatever reason access to a defensive weapon should a threat present itself. Even if the teacher doesn't want to use it, they can also open it up and allow someone else who's in the room at the time who is willing to use it in case of an emergency. Now these safes can also be triggered by the center, central office staff and be unlocked for those who are in rooms that don't have teachers. How about instant locks on the heavy gauge classroom doors that can be set from the teacher's position? So the teacher reaches underneath their desk and locks the door instantly, similar to what sign alarms are used by uh, bank tellers. And then finally, let's provide central locking systems from the main office that lock all the classrooms, all the hallway doors, limiting the shooter's movement from wing to wing and room to room. Schools could also provide impenetrable door jams for use. Now I've provided a link below to a video of one such device that's designed by a Brighton Caring High School student in Wisconsin in response to the Florida shootings. Now as most conservatives will ask when sweeping ideas like these are promoted, how are we gonna pay for all of this? Well. You know, we give billions, and that's with a B, to countries that hate us. I say, let's use that money and provide the funding for these projects. Let's give our children a safe place to enrich their mind, learn to think critically, and provide hope for a better future. We can't provide for other countries until we properly provide for our own. So what's the result? Well, while we can only do so much to limit attempts of evil action while honoring our constitutional rights, I believe that by understanding all the parameters and the options and the ramifications, that we could greatly limit the shootings and the resulting carnage by making schools less appealing targets for those with those darkened hearts. You know, we are the greatest nation on this earth. In the past, we fought tyranny, we've ended world wars, and we continue to defend those who can't defend themselves. We need to come together and defend the kids in our schools. We can solve this issue. 
I love this nation and I love the kids in it. I believe they deserve our affection and our protection. Thanks for watching. I'm Canyon Man, and these are my chronicles.